welcome back. I Is it working? Yes. Welcome back. Um, a brief announcement from my side. It's uh, fantastic that you are still going very strong after what is day two of an extremely intense program. And uh, we still have quite a lot uh, in front of us for today. Um, but the reason I am sitting here is just I wanted to uh, recall to everybody that we have uh, posters, poster sessions, uh, at lunchtime, but also outside every day. Um, if you are not here for the full duration of the Paris Symposium, which is, after all, seven days, including tomorrow where we'll have some uh, uh, governance meetings, um, please then check out the posters on the app, which I hope you have succeeded in downloading. You can see all the posters there, and there are the QR codes everywhere where you can please vote for your preferred three posters. There will be a, uh, an award uh, to the best poster afterwards. So um, please look at the posters, give comments and support the young students and our young uh, researchers who are um, contributing here. This was a competitive uh, process and, um, and vote for uh, your preferred ones. Thank you. I hand over to Hélène. Um, so, I'm delighted to, to chair this session. We are going to have two uh, talks on pretty different topics. And uh, the first speaker is um, Barry Ashen Green, so needs no introduction. Uh, I just want to point out, I didn't know, but he is a doctor honoris causa from the American University in Paris, which uh, mm. is another of his honors uh, on his very long uh, <laughs> visa already. And uh, Barry has been taking part in the rapid response a program of, on Ukraine that CEPR has uh, put, and that has been, I think, an incredibly uh, important initiative. So, Barry, please. Helen, thank you. Um, something else you, you may or may not know. Um, it, it's a special pleasure to me to be here celebrating the 40th anniversary of C CEPR because I can claim to have been the first CEPR fellow um, or I can claim to have been a CEPR fellow before there were CEPR <laughs> fellows that Richard Portis and Stephen Yeo uh, had three, three offices. I think that's a, a grand way of describing their space. They had three rooms, two of which they were using, and I had a research project in London uh, at the time, so they allowed me to use the third <laughs> of the three, and here we are 40 years later. So, um, management has asked me to talk about the CPR Ukraine initiative, which I think will be familiar to, uh, to many people in the room through its um, successive publications, uh, a, a blueprint for the reconstruction of Ukraine, macroeconomic policies for wartime Ukraine, and I learned uh, yesterday, actually, that there is a third one coming uh, a, a third CEPR policy inside financing democracy, why and how partners should support Ukraine. So th this is also a reminder of an important respect in which um, CEPR uh, differs from that other policy network across the pond in that we do give um, direct policy advice to anyone who will listen. Um, so, um, let me start with uh, estimates uh, uh, of reconstruction costs. Some of this comes from the third forthcoming CEPR policy insight. Uh, costs of reconstruction, of course, are a moving target. Uh, there are different estimates, and those estimates need to be updated uh, with events as the war uh, proceeds. Reconstruction costs currently range from, and I apologize for, for using U.S. dollar figures here. I should have updated that set of, uh, set of slides before I came over. They range from, but, but we have parity, right? So it does, <laughs> doesn't make a, a lot of difference. They range from about $400 billion to a trillion dollars, cumulative spread over 10 years, because 10 years is typically how long it takes a, a war-torn economy to complete the process uh, of physical and economic reconstruction. So if you take the lower bound of 400 billion and, and you divide it by 10, 
uh, you're talking about $40 billion of finance a year. Ukraine's GDP was $200 billion, according to the World Bank et al., prior to the war, and uh, we know that uh, potential and actual GDP will be lower in the immediate post-war years because of physical destruction of capital stock infrastructure uh, and so forth, although um, the IMF, for one, is growing more optimistic about the economy's uh, growth prospects in 2023 and hopefully uh, going forward. But the uh, figure on the right is a reminder that uh, we probably should be talking about an economy uh, with current p potential output uh, capacity of 150 billion U.S. dollars rather than the uh, pre-pandemic, pre-war level. Um, gross savings in Ukraine averaged 13 percent, not, not a high savings economy in the, in the three uh, years prior to COVID. And again, I think there's a question of whether Ukraine can match those savings rates during the, the, uh, the reconstruction period when people have foregone consumption as well. Uh, put all this together and it becomes quite clear that the costs of reconstruction will very significantly exceed the resources that Ukraine will be able to mobilize on its own. So what to do? Um, a substantial portion of that reconstruction uh, will have to be financed in any realistic scenario out of Ukrainian savings. But if Ukraine has a GDP of $150 billion U.S., uh, if 5% of that is devoted to reconstruction, that will leave a $33 billion per annum gap to be filled out of the sources that I list uh, in the remaining bullet points on the, on the slide. Out of frozen Russian assets, uh, probably only the interest, or certainly only the interest from those frozen Russian assets given legal um, constraints on garnishing them um, and redeploying them for reconstruction purposes, legal constraints that continue to worry the uh, U.S. government. Uh, for example, higher global interest rates mean that the interest on those frozen uh, uh, Russian assets go further now. So w we are talking about something uh, in, in the four to uh, five billion dollar per annum range given current, cu the current level of interest rates. Reparations from Russia, good luck collecting that. Uh, I write here and for uh, historians of the 1920s like me, whenever I hear the, the word re reparations, I think of the 1920s and of what, what came after the 1920s. So I, I worry about uh, uh, saddling Russia with a large reparations bill when Ukraine will want uh, at least a tolerant major nuclear power uh, on, on its border once the war is over. Foreign direct investment. Uh, FDI going into a war-torn region will need war insurance, and war insurance is expensive. So most of the people that I, I've talked to and my collaborators on these previous projects have talked to are not terribly optimistic about attracting large amounts of FDI in the short, short run. What about commercial borrowing by uh, the Ukrainian government and, and other Ukrainian uh, Entities Again, I think commercial lending is unlikely to be forthcoming in large amounts in an uncertain geopolitical environment, um, even assuming swift, deep restructuring uh, uh, of the country's inherited debts. And we know that swift, deep, and restructuring are three words that don't typically go together. Uh, official lending uh, at quasi-commercial rates would require debt service payments that grained Ukrainian services, uh, grained Ukrainian savings. Uh, and it's worth noting here that the latest uh, EU aid package that I've seen from November designed to cover the next four years is only one-third grants and uh, two-third long-term loans. Donor aid, presumably uh, donor aid will fill the remaining gap if it's going to, to be filled. There's there is, by uh, the calculations of the first couple of bullet points, uh, $28 billion per annum 
gap, that's 20% of first year GDP for Ukraine to be filled by the donors uh, or, or not to be filled at all. So um, to put that in the context of the Marshall Plan after World War II, uh, the Marshall Plan was $13.3 million cumulative over four years, and that was 5% of US GDP in 1948, that being the first year of the Marshall Plan, $280 billion cumulative over 10 years, multiplying up that 28 billion by 10 is, by comparison, a much smaller 0.6% of G7 2023 GDP. It's 1% of US GDP in, in the first year of this hypothetical 10-year reconstruction uh, period. And we can double these percentages if you prefer high-end estimates uh, uh, of reconstruction costs. The, either way, the, the, the point I'm making here is that the uh, actual dollar amounts are small relative to the productive capacity of the potential donors in comparison with what was done by the United States uh, after World War II. So by that standard, uh, uh, the aid that Ukraine will require for reconstruction is doable economically, um, although there are large inherited budget deficits that need to be cut on debt sustainability grounds and all, all that. Um, the case also has to be made uh, politically. If you've been following the news in the last week out of Washington, D.C., you will be aware that the case also has to be made politically, and, and uh, we have, have some ways to go in terms of, uh, uh, of making it. The third forthcoming CPR policy insight makes the case along these lines. Uh, defensive democratic uh, values, uh, Ukraine is a democracy fighting an autocracy. Um, security, global security, European security, if Russia triumphs, it gains additional leverage o over global food supplies, among other things. If uh, Ukrainian uh, reconstruction founders and Russia becomes more dominant in the region, people will begin to ask again who, who, who will be next. Um, and we can make the case in, in, in a more positive political sense as well by reminding the donors that the commitment is only temporary that uh, the Marshall Plan, the European Recovery Program, was only temporary. It, it lasted for uh, four years. It, it, you know, uh, that the negative political part is depicted with um, Stalin blocking the extension of the Marshall Plan to Eastern Europe, which he successfully did. This cartoon shows you the positive political case where the, uh, I, I, I guess the American on, uh, on the left says this will help keep you going till 1952, and the European on the right says, thanks, I think I can produce uh, uh, enough to pay for all I need by then. So um, Ukraine needs to spell out uh, how it's gonna wean itself from, uh, from foreign aid as well. Uh, that sh will be part of a larger bargain then. For its part, Ukraine has to reassure the donors that it will wean itself from foreign aid. Uh, which, which in turn means coming up with a coherent reconstruction plan, addressing Western concerns about corruption. So rightly or wrongly, the perception in Washington, D.C. is that corruption remains a major problem in, uh, in, in, in Ukraine, and it is widely cited as a major problem by those who are um, opposed for whatever reason to uh, uh, ex extending U.S. aid to the country. I show you Transparency International's time series measure of, um, uh, of corruption, trans uh, of clean government, and it shows, it, it ranks Ukraine still very low even in recent years. So uh, the, the government has done a variety of things to try to um, address concerns about corruption from replacing important personnel to uh, enhancing trans uh, transparency of public procurement by creating this website, ProZoro, where the bids and the disbursements and everything are uh, public knowledge and in principle can be verified by 
one and all. Uh, the third report suggests also that uh, there should be regular income and wealth declarations by public officials um, and, and, and more generally uh, transparent accounting of budgeting and, and expenditure where creating a state of the art fiscal council, a national fiscal council would be uh, part of that process. Um, coming up with that coherent reconstruction plan means you need an umbrella agency for coordination and consultation which in, uh, on which sit representatives of all the relevant government ministries, uh, advisory committees of private sector representatives as well. Uh, this uh, uh, umbrella agency organizes top-down projects, the national energy grid, the telecommunications grid, the transport system, which have to be coordinated uh, at the national uh, level and, and presumably should be coordinated in a manner compatible with EU standards and systems because EU accession is the end game here. Uh, but that umbrella organization should also solicit, uh, solicit bottom-up projects generated by state and local governments that are on the ground and have a better sense of local needs. And this um, uh, umbrella agency needs to coordinate with uh, uh, the various donors uh, as well as mobilizing and allocating the government's own resources. So if you go to the uh, government portal of the, uh, the Ukrainian gov government's main website, you can see a recently created National Council for the Recovery of Ukraine from the war. And, and it, it is intended, as I read it, to um, carry out very much these functions. So there is uh, a, a, a council in place to do this kind of coordination, but uh, um, we, we will ha have to see with time how effectively it, um, it operates. And a, a, and a coherent recovery scheme means as well maintaining macroeconomic stability. So the second of the three CEPR reports uh, focused on, on, on what specifically that means. It means limiting budget deficits to avoid um, fiscal dominance and, and, and runaway inflation. Uh, which in turn requires broadening the tax base, digitizing uh, government services, which have been done uh, successfully by certain other economies in, in the region broadly defined, eliminating uh, publicly funded subsidies. Um, elect household electricity is subsidized much more heavily than it is in most EU countries. Um, shifting more resources to local governments means testing social programs, and importantly, I think, especially for an economy that is demographically challenged, like Ukraine is, raising the retirement age, which is currently 60 for men, and I think it may be even lower than that last time I looked for, for women. So bringing that in line with EU standards would help as well. Um, people from uh, other EU countries will remind me that this is easy to say and hard to do politically, but it, it's I think especially urgent in this context. Um, maintaining macroeconomic stability means that monetary policy, the uh, National Bank of Ukraine should return to inflation targeting, which it has done in the past, <coughs> as, soon, as soon as that's uh, feasible. Uh, macro prudential tools um, should be uh, deployed to limit boom bust cycles in uh, bank lending uh, that in turn will provide room for a managed floating exchange rate, uh, operating a pegged exchange rate, and there, th there were those um, in the group who felt that it should continue to do so, partly because of um, uh, the prospect of EU accession, that it's pres presumably going to want to be part of ER ERM2 and eventually the euro area, so why not? pegged to the euro now, and the, and the answer, my answer to that would be because there are going to be large shocks coming down the road that would uh, severely test any, any prospective peg, um, which is what this slide says. Um, labor market policies um, protect workers and not 
jobs, expand child care and flexible work because there has been a brain and body drain from Ukraine and there is that demographic problem uh, uh, of a uh, aging population um, that uh, makes uh, encouraging labor force participation uh, a priority. Uh, issue housing vouchers to allow for internal migration and reduce uh, spatial mismatches. If there is going to be mig migration from the east to the west of the country, recon simply attempting to reconstruct the prior housing stock or giving people a claim to an apartment in the city that they used to live in isn't going to cut it. Housing vouchers might be a more effective solution here. And more generally, there is going to be a uh, a sig significant sectoral reallocation, presumably away from heavy industry which dominated in the East and provided um, armaments and other, other things to Russian markets in favor of uh, uh, other goods, agriculture and services that will be exported in, in growing amounts to the EU. So uh, pu putting in place re retraining programs can facilitate that process. Um, here it's worth um, mentioning, I think, uh, in, in the previous slide, uh, the bottom point was uh, this retraining and, and education can be backed by donor aid and donor technical assistance, and the Marshall Plan was a good case where uh, its productivity programs did exactly that. So European government officials, industrial managers, trade union leaders in that case went to the United States and studied how Henry Ford did it at, at his River Rouge plant and brought some of that knowledge back. I like this paper by Michaela Giorcelli uh, at UCLA very much because she noted that uh, a, a bunch of Italian regions were nominated to send productivity missions to the United States before the funding was scaled down. Only some of them actually did, and the ones that uh, actually sent uh, the re re relevant industrial leaders ended up doing very significantly better in terms of, uh, of industrial output and growth over the succeeding 15 years compared to the control group of otherwise very, very similar Italian regions with similar industrial structures that, um, that didn't get to go in the end. Uh, the donors should be part of this bargain as well. Uh, the donors should acknowledge that uh, reconstruction plans have to be owned by Ukrainians, and that means giving Ukraine a good deal of license in terms of designing that reconstruction program. So um, those responsible for conditionality, because donor funds typically do come with conditions, should not succumb to the temptation to micromanage too much, and the other part of the donor's bargain is actually to deliver what they promise. And there are issues here uh, in Washington, D.C. this week, as I said before, but the problem is more, more, more general. So, uh, uh, so far as I can tell, I looked at this again a couple of weeks ago, countries like Austria and Norway have made multi-million or billion dollar commitments but dispersed exactly zero aid to Ukraine so far. So this is a, a, a problem all around. How should the donors organize themselves? Uh, th this problem is more complex than it was in Marshall Plan years when there was only one donor. And uh, Washington, D.C. could decide uh, how, how it was going to dole out the money, where it was going to place its representatives, and so forth. Uh, at toward the beginning of this year, it was decided that the G7 should be in charge of recovery planning on the donor side for Ukraine, uh, and that it should establish a multi-agency donor coordination platform with a three-person steering committee, an American national security advisor, uh, uh, the Ukrainian finance minister, uh, and an EU director general. So the EU and the United States apparently both like this design, but I think it raises issues like uh, how will other countries, what kind of input will other countries get, what, uh, and, and, and there I think uh, the, the 
solution is supposed to be meeting with those other political leaders, meeting with uh, representatives uh, of the Bretton Woods institutions, the various European investment banks, and so forth, periodically. Um, you all have some experience with, with rotating presidencies, and there is a question here of whether a rotate, another rotating presidency will be uh, effective. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't putting the European Commission in, uh, in charge have been better given how EU membership is the ultimate goal, how EU institutions have committed more funding than the United States, at least on paper. And the other part of this uh, uh, agreement about which I have reservations is that the head office is going to be in Brussels and not in Kiev where uh, you know, head office uh, of the R ERP was in Paris, although they certainly reported back to, to Washington, D.C. And will a dedicated staff of eight or ten really be sufficient to do the uh, planning on the donor side? Finally, and I'll conclude in a, in, in a, in a couple of minutes, uh, uh, I, I, I should uh, say some cautionary words about a large-scale foreign aid program for uh, for reconstruction purposes. There are some negative lessons from the Marshall Plan as well. There was unresolved tension then about whether to use the available finance for security and the military on the one hand or for economic reconstruction and modernization. On the other, too much U.S. money on the Marshall Plan was tied. It had to be spent on agricultural goods and other things grown and produced in the United States. The donors liked grand projects, new European highways, new European ports, and many of the recipients liked grand projects as well. So this figure shows you uh, European investment rates and European growth rates during the Marshall Plan years, and there are some outliers. Norway got a lot of money, but it didn't grow and that's because it used all its Marshall Plan money to electrify the North. Uh, there were social reasons to do that. Maybe there were security-related reasons, but it didn't contribute much in the, in, 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 in the way of GDP growth. Um, projects sometimes were poorly informed by facts on the ground, uh, donor fo fatigue, and um, uh, the Korean War led this program to end abruptly in 1951, and there are, are stories of corruption on, on, under the Marshall Plan, although they don't figure in the official histories. The example of the 12 families in Greece who ended up controlling all the ship, shipping in the country when um, that industry was rebuilt. So I actually had some fun recently reading this uh, unofficial history of the Marshall Plan in Greece, which talks about a few successes and, and a few failures. Um, the uh, fa failure I bring to your attention and then I will close is, for example, the United States spent approximately $1 million to buy horses for Greece to be used for agricultural purposes. Entirely uh, sensible. While at face value the program may have been useful, most of the horses bought were too old to breed and thus, thus useless in the long term and also often bred for racing and therefore useless in the field. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Barry. That was an uh, incredibly precise and uh, extremely thoughtful uh, account. Uh, I, you must have s some questions. We are very short of time, but I think I will allow for one uh, or two questions if uh, Barry promises me that he can keep answers short. Uh, so I, I can see uh, Silvana here. Thank you for the presentation. So what's your view on using uh, uh, frozen Russian assets in reconstruction? What's, what's your view on using frozen Russian assets on uh, reconstruction? So, so my view is certainly uh, using the interest so long as the assets remain frozen. But I um, continue to have reservations on, on, on the same grounds that I'm not convinced about the case for reparations. I, 
it, you know, uh, op opinion within the Biden administration, I think, is swinging toward uh, garnishing those frozen assets and redeploying them, but we'll see. Thanks a lot. Uh, the last one, Refet. I fully agree with your position that um, the aid shouldn't be micromanaged and Ukrainians should take ownership of the reconstruction. On the other hand, I'd like to ask whether Ukraine has with the remaining bureaucratic capital and human capital to plan and implement a reconstruction on its own right. And related to that, whether we, and I actually mean we, CPR, and economists here, can contribute, and if so, how? So if, if I heard the question you're asking about um, uh, human capital as a form of foreign aid as well, uh, you know, it, it's notable that the three uh, reports that we've done have been collaborations with people in Ukraine as well. And um, I, I, speaking for myself, I've been impressed by the people that we've worked with. I think they, they have, we should feel confident in their capacity to organize this process, but we should help. Thanks a lot, Chris, for a difficult transition. <laughs> But we are going to go to the second talk on a very different topic. And uh, so I'm delighted now to introduce Shevlen Kalem-Lyorskan, who also doesn't need much introduction. She has a very distinguished uh, academic CV, and she has also uh, done a lot of uh, policy work and has a had a lot of impact, in particular, but not only, being senior advisor at the IMF uh, during pretty troubled times. So Shevlen, please go ahead. Thank you, Helen, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, as always. Um, the organizers asked me to present uh, this paper that uh, I joined the road with Phyllis Unsal, sitting here from OECD uh, currently and IMF. Uh, we did this paper for the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity for the fall, uh, September 2023. So the usual disclaimer applies, given Phyllis's position. The paper is going to be on a very different topic, as Helen said, global transmission of Fed hikes. Let me get to it. Um, we all care about international transmission of the US monetary policy, especially if we are now going to be in a fragmented world. This world is going to be inflationary. That's uh, we understood the last three years, and in that world, uh, U.S. monetary policy is going to be central, as we know uh, from a huge literature now building on Helen's work. So what we want to do here is try to understand what happened in the last three years. So um, during 2022-2023, Fed, Federal Reserve, went through its most rapid hiking cycle in the last 40 years. So just to remind ourselves the magnitudes, they increased interest rates 5.5 percentage points in an extremely short period of time. So no matter how you look at it, this constitutes a large shock by any historical standard. Now, when we look at historical similar episodes, there are, there are actually several, but I'm going to highlight three very famous ones uh, when, when Fed hike uh, this amount. So the first famous episode, of course, 70s, 80s, Volcker disinflation that led to Latin American debt crisis. Then the famous 1994-1995 tightening, and that led to Asian crisis. And most recently, uh, May 2013, known as taper tantrum. Very interesting because that one actually not even uh, an episode of Fed hiking. Fed signaled that it's going to hike, led to these capital outflows uh, and exchange depreciations in several emerging markets. Now, so far, we didn't see anything. This doesn't mean we are not going to see anything. But so far, no financial crisis, no major construction. And what we would like to do is like why this time is different. Again, it may turn out to be not to a year down the road, given the strong US economy, Fed may not have been done with tightening. But just so far, if you take the stock of 2022, 2023, why uh, we are witnessing a different episode? That's, that's the question we ask. So to answer this question, we are going to uh, operate in four building blocks. First, we are going to revisit the historical evidence. Historical evidence being we are going to analyze the period from 1990 to 2019. So just stop right before the COVID and try to uh, uh, communicate to you and show you that the adverse effects of Fed hikes 
that we experienced during this historical period is about the financial channel, the dominant role of financial channel in US monetary policy transmission rather than the trade channel. Now, the underlying reason is going to be this tight relationship between Fed uh, hikes, US monetary policy, and the risk sentiment going back to Helen's work. So risk tolerance of global investors goes down when Fed hikes the interest rate. That is going to create a risk off sentiment on all the risk assets, of course, uh, but we are going to focus on here emerging market assets, and of course emerging market assets are risk assets in any investor's portfolio. So the, um, you know, the, the jargon that media uses for this or you know, finance people is like this is the dollar comes home effect. Then we are going to zoom in on the key factors that, that really makes emerging market a risk asset class. I'm sure everybody has their own favorite list and you can probably put down 10 different factors here. But we are going to show you that two really stand out in all these things that you think bad about emerging markets, bad institutions, bad fundamentals, you know, so whatever your, your favorite item in your list, we are going to show you that two really stand out and these two is going to be high dollar debt high dollar debt associated weak balance sheet, you know, have it in the public sector or the private sector because you are going to have a currency mismatch where your assets are in local currency, your debt is in dollars. I mean, it is in foreign currency, but this debt is mostly going to be in dollars. And the second factor is lack of monetary policy credibility. Then we are going to fourth building block. We'll come to this final episode, the resilience, 2022, 2023 emerging market resilience, and we show you that this decreased dollar debt before this episode when we come to this point and increase monetary policy credibility actually going to help them a lot in terms of pricing the Fed hikes into risk premia. We are going to show you that historically Fed hikes are going to be priced in risk premia and this is not going to happen this time around, uh, especially on the emerging markets that uh, did a lot of work on reducing their dollar debt, especially in the private sector and improving their monetary policy credibility. Okay, let me show you the very simple narrative. I would like you to think two countries, Mexico and Canada. Why Mexico and Canada? These are the two closest neighbors of the United States, and of course they are under a trade agreement. So you expect any you know, issue in terms of transmission going to trade is going to work similarly on Mexico and trade. But some of the things are going to be very different. So the top uh, uh, little windows are going to be the taper tantrum. So you see the x-axis is going to be starting 2013 Q1 and going to 2014 Q4. To remind you, taper tantrum happened in May 2013 with a speech by then the chairman Ben Bernanke in signaling the upcoming Fed hikes. So Mexico is going to be plotted in red, Canada in uh, blue. And we'll start with normal exchange rate depreciation. So this is peso vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, Canadian dollar vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, the top uh, um, left uh, window. And that just tells you exchange rate depreciated similarly in both countries. Look at the risk spread. So the mid, um, mid uh, figure is going to be the long-term risk spreads measured as a 10-year government bond spreads. And you see the Mexican one going up and the Canada one not, not much going on. And the last one is the UIP deviation, which is going to be the short-term risk premium because this is going to be on the 12th month uh, bonds. And that you can see short-term risk premium is going up on Mexico, but not Canada. Now, the bottom is going to be this time around, 2022 Q1 is the starting, that's when, you know, Fed started. 2021 Q4, they signaled, but they started the hiking 2020 Q1. And you see something very different. Exchange is actually, you know, not much, some depreciation in Canada, appreciation in Mexico. But what is happening, especially in terms of risk spreads, the mid-bottom and the, uh, the bottom right, you see that both long-term and short-term risk premium is not increasing in Mexico. They are acting very similar in Mexico and Canada, and the short one is actually not much going on in Canada, and actually Mexico one is declining. So we are going to argue that this is going to be the key reason why this time around emerging markets shown resilience and didn't observe these worse outcomes that were common to emerging markets historically. Let me tell you what type of data we are going to use to show that this is a systematic story. So this is not just about Mexico and Canada. Mexico and Canada, of course, very good examples here, but it is actually about a, a wide range of uh, emerging markets. Now, the key thing here is going to be measuring monetary policy credibility. This is going to be an extremely difficult thing to do. And what we are going to do here is uh, rely on a new data set by the fund constructed by my co-author, Phyllis Insal, and her co-authors known as the IPOC index. And 
what they do, I mean, if you have questions afterwards, Feliz, of course, can answer them, but they did a very detailed analysis using the narrative approach of Romero and Romero, going through thousands and thousands of documents, try to understand the monetary policy practice. So this is very different than a regime way of thinking monetary policy credibility, right? When we think about a peg versus float, inflation targeter versus not, independent central bank versus not independent central bank, that is kind of more like a binary regime-based uh, classification. This is uh, something about understanding, assessing the monetary policy practices in three areas, independence and accountability, policy and operational strategy and communication. So transparency, communication, how you explain all these things going to matter, and that's why this index is going to call IPOC index. So I'm going to show you figures in a minute to uh, tell you exactly it captures what we want it to capture. The second piece of data, of course, uh, is going to be the dollar debt, FX debt. Here we are going to focus on the private sector, corporates and households. This data is going to come from BIS. And we have uh, basically three reasons to do that. Why not look at the entire country's FX debt? Because first of all, we would like to capture the real exposures, real dollar debt, and not just some estimate or a proxy based on net foreign liabilities or the current account the external debt. Second, we are focusing on emerging markets. And emerging markets' financial sector is regulated to be hedged. So in that sense, we don't want actually the, the dollar debt for the banks or the financial intermediaries in emerging markets because there is going to be a derivative contracts on their balance sheet hedging the currency risk. So we, we don't want to uh, uh, mismeasure uh, the vulnerability here. And lastly, emerging market governments known to increase their borrowing in local currency uh, graduated from original sin, as coined by uh, Barry. So in that sense, we are looking at a long period. There will be this compositional shift from dollar borrowing to local currency borrowing. So we also don't want to, in that sense, uh, muddy the waters with the government. So we are going to focus on corporates and households. OK, here is a picture of this data. So on the left, you see the policy credibility index. Unfortunately, this index started in 2007. It doesn't go earlier than that, but still, from 2007 to 2021, you can see the improvement in emerging markets. Emerging markets is in red, median emerging market, and then the average, and the advanced countries is in uh, blue. Uh, you see that advanced countries start at a high level. Uh, this is an index between zero and one, and emerging markets catch up at the end of the cycle. On the right, the non-financial private sector affects that. So we are going to use the red one, Red one is the non-financial private sector FX debt as a share of total <laughs> debt. So you see that that red is somewhere around like less than 10%, which is uh, amazing to a historical standard. Those of us who work with this data since late 1990s in Latin American countries especially know that these numbers were used to be around 50, 60%. Half of your corporate sector was in debt in dollars. And now we have, at least for the average country, very low levels. But still. If you look at the numbers on the y-axis, not that high. The green is the uh, effects that, uh, you know, estimated from that black line from the Benetrix et al. data, showing a similar pattern. And the blue is, the, again, focus on the non-financial private sector effects that, but as a percent of GDP, which, again, um, with the optic at the end of the sample, still is going to be lower compared to historical standards. And we are going to be using the red one in our analysis. This is uh, showing you that the monetary policy credibility index we are using is actually measuring something meaningful. So here we are showing the relation of the, uh, between the index and the inflation expectation, one year ahead and five year ahead on the top, and year on year inflation and five year moving average inflation on the bottom. You see that there is a negative relationship, as you expect. So basically, you know, the more credible monetary policy you have, lower your inflation and lower your inflation expectations. But look who is driving it. The red dots are driving it. Everything is color-coded in the presentation. Red is going to be these emerging markets. So emerging markets observations are driving this relationship, which, of course, goes back to this improvement during this time period. OK, let me now summarize the result and conclude. So we are going to use a local projection framework. Quarterly frequency data start in 1990. We have 42 emerging markets. When we use the IPOC index, we are going to go down to 34 emerging markets in terms of the effects that 15 emerging markets, unfortunately. When we say historical episode, regressions for the historical episode, those are going to be ending 2019 Q4. And the recent episode is 2021 Q4, 2022 uh, Q4. So we are going to run this regression in equation one, which is a similar specification to this very nice paper uh, by Murray Opsfeld and Hanan Zhu on the global dollar cycle from one year ago, Brookings. 
So instead of you know, the dollar shock they use, we are going to use the US monetary policy shock. So you see that the left-hand side macro finance variables such as GDP, exchange rate, inflation, UIP premium, and capital flows, they are going to be regressed on this uh, US monetary policy shock in blue. And then we are going to have global controls in the capital X, like, of course, lags of all these variables. And for robustness, we are going to add the US dollar shock which is the dollar appreciation vis-a-vis -vis G7 countries, oil price index, FX reserves, medium country trade balance, and so forth. And the little x is going to be the country-specific control, very importantly, GDP growth and inflation uh, differentials and the lags, four lags. Okay, when we want to differentiate now these effects of uh, US monetary policy shock, the Fed hike, on these macro finance outcomes by high credibility, low credibility country, and high effects that low effects that country, we are going to run these local projections interacting the, that US policy shock, the uh, ITUS hat blue variable with our IPOC index in the first year. So we are going to use this in a time invariant sense first to say, okay, by the time when there is this huge discrepancy in the distribution by country, if we can show you historically the worst effects of the Fed hikes is realized by these low monetary policy credibility countries is equation three is going to help us to calculate the marginal effects using the 25th percentile country in the monetary policy credibility index distribution versus 75th percentile country for the high credibility country. And for effects that we will do the same thing, the first year being 2000, we are going to use this low and high to calculate these effects. Okay, monetary policy shocks, I'm go just going to, uh, you know, spend little time on this. This is a huge literature. Uh, if there are questions, I can come back to this. And it is actually, quite difficult to measure uh, exogenous monetary policy shock. So we are going to follow this high frequency identification literature that builds on, uh, you know, trying to identify surprises in the short window, goes back to work by uh, Refet and Eric. So we are going to first show you results uh, using the gertler karadi shocks. This is because this is used a lot in the international transmission literature. Helen uses this in her papers with Sylvia, so we are going to do that. Of course, this literature just you know, evolves very rapidly. Recently, you know, these shocks being criticized that they have some news in it, information in it, and all that. So we are also going to use the state of the art Bauer Swanson shocks uh, from last year's NBR macro annual library. Okay. The uh, key result here, you can see emerging markets on the top, advanced economies on the bottom. This is the historical result. You see that there is a very severe and prolonged output contraction when Fed hikes. Here, Fed hike is uh, exogenous through these uh, high frequency identification where such a thing doesn't happen in advanced economies. UIP premium goes up in emerging markets. Remember, this risk channel is going to be the key channel here. Exchange rate depreciates more uh, in emerging markets. There is some depreciation in advanced economies and other specifications too, but for us, the critical thing is not the exchange rate, but the UIP premium. Now, low credibility countries, so when we go to the, these low credibility on the top, high credibility on the bottom graphs, now we are within an emerging market sample. Within an emerging market sample, we are cutting it very thin, uh, slicing the data. So there are going to be effects on everyone, but you can see that the output effect is going to be more severe and long lasting uh, on the first column in the low monetary policy credibility countries, and UIP premium is going to increase way more in the low credibility countries relative to high credibility countries. Exchange rate response is going to be similar among the low and high credibility countries. And high effects, that is the same thing. Again, now you are within a 15 emerging markets. It's a much smaller sample, so you are going to see effects both, but still the quantitative impact and the uh, long-lasting version is going to be for the high effects that countries versus low effects that countries. And also for high effects that countries, there's going to be capital outflows as you see in the bottom, bottom row. Okay, let me talk about the recent episode and conclude. Let me show you the CDS spread. So, uh, you know, risk premium you can capture in several ways. I mean, um, if you really want to separate the currency and the default risk, CDS is one way of doing it. So this is CDS spreads on emerging markets, average emerging markets. You see that it spikes during the global financial crisis and during COVID. But of course, that's with Argentina. So without Argentina, you are looking at the dash line. Okay, so dash line is the, you know, average spread. Since not much happened, 500 is kind of a, you know, rule of thumb level. Not much happened since the global financial crisis. Recently, you see 
the optic at the end of the sample, but look at the median, the typical emerging market. So that is nothing happening, nothing happening in terms of risk pricing. And this actually includes, I believe, uh, Turkey. So we are just uh, taking out Argentina here. UIP uh, for uh, the average emerging market, again, actually it doesn't go up. In fact, this time around, advanced economy UIP goes up more than the emerging market. Exchange rate depreciation is very similar. Advanced economy blue, emerging market red, very similar exchange rate depreciation as of first quarter of 2022. High credibility country blue is going to have uh, appreciation actually instead of a depreciation of the exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the dollar where low monetary policy credibility country is going to have a depreciation of the exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. Okay, let me conclude. So the archetypal type of emerging crisis is the Asian crisis, 97-98-02, as the Fed raised rates, pulling capital back to US. We started seeing these events with first Thailand's peg uh, broke, leading to panic, spread to South Korea, Indonesia, Brazil, Turkey, Russia, Argentina, and actually with a spillback, it ended up back to the US with LTSM crisis. A decade later in 2013, there was an emerging market sell-off and Fed signal tightening. It was just a speech signaling the tightening. Actual tightening didn't happen then. 2022, 2023, there was a 5.5 percentage points hike in less than 15 months and nothing happened. Our paper shows that financial channel of international transmission was less strong this time around. It's not that it was absent, it's just less strong this time around relative to historical episodes due to improved monetary policy credibility and lower effects there. Lower effects and higher credibility means that you are going to be charged a lower risk premium by international investors, and this is at the heart of the financial channel. Let me conclude with a quote and a case in point country Turkey. So this is a quote from Gita Gopinath, first deputy managing director of the IMF from her September 2023 South Africa speech, the same month we uh, finished this paper and presented. She said, and I quote, in the current high for long environment, global financial conditions for emerging markets can be expected to remain challenging. Despite sharply raising US rates, EMs have demonstrated resilience. Though inflation in emerging markets rose, inflation expectation remain anchored. These outcomes owe much to improvements many emerging markets made to their policy frameworks, financial sectors during the last decades. Central bank independence, inflation targeting, exchange rate flexibility, and regulation of their financial sectors all played a critical role. Let me now talk about Turkish case. Uh, in the paper, we have a very detailed analysis of Turkey going back to 1990s with how all the macro variables evolving, you know, changing the exchange regime, inflation target and all that, and it shows how important monetary policy credibility in terms of the risk premium. And here, foreign holdings of Turkish government debt, this is local currency government debt, basically less than 1%, as of you know, the beginning of this year from a high 22% in 2015. So Turkey actually improved monetary policy credit and then lost it and <coughs> at the good times, foreigner holdings of this debt was 22%. Recently, foreigners bought 860 million in lira dollar in lira dominated Turkish government bond. And this is the biggest capital inflow re record as recorded since they were collecting this debt within a year. The reason, of course, when you talk about, talk to financial guys, portfolio managers, hedge fund, and all that, they say broad economy policy overhaul. Alliance Global said to the recent Financial Times article covering this, new monetary and fiscal policies were sending positive signals that Turkey is fighting inflation, allowing the central bank to be independent and working on tackling the fiscal deterioration. Turkey is in the JP Morgan bond index, and that is the worst performer. Turkey was the worst performer in that index, a 53% fall, uh, in 2023, and now back to 25%, highest level in almost uh, two decades, again within a year, <coughs> where uh, there were many calls from these uh, uh, investors, international investors, saying it is about the monetary policy credibility. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this super clear presentation, and since you have been super on time as well, we have actually time for a question or two. Again, if you promise to be uh, very brief in answers. So uh, let me start by Stein here. Yes. So we'll have three questions. Sylvain, I'm sorry, you, you, you will. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, <coughs> uh, very nice. Uh, I do wonder, however, we use the words policy credibility, but in the essence, what it boils down to, at least in the recent case, is that the emerging market just raised interest rates earlier than the Fed did. In some sense, your policy shocks may have gone the other way around at least in inducing the Fed to do what they should have been doing maybe earlier. So can you be more specific on what the role was of the interest rate increases that they actually did 
in terms of <coughs> provide, uh, given the outcome that you, uh, you call. And we, we're going to take you three questions, so that's, uh, yeah. So, uh, yes. Great, so we'll be able to merge those two. And the third one is uh, Pierre Olivier. Thank you. So, really, very nice work. Uh, very proud also that uh, the indicator of uh, monetary policy comes from the fund. Uh, but a, a quick question on uh, um, other potential explanations. So the recent tightening is uh, happening at the same time as we had a huge increase in commodity prices. Many of these emerging market economies that you're looking at are commodity producers and they're going to benefit from the increase in commodity prices. So curious about whether that factors into the analysis and, and to what extent. Thanks. We can okay. try, yeah. All right, so let me start with Pierre Olivier's question because that's the easiest one. So we, uh, it, it is actually very interesting, but not most of our countries are commodity exporters. We have eight of them and we drop all of them and the results are actually even stronger. And uh, we also, so we do two things. We drop all these commodity guys and we still can keep a, enough of a big sample of the non-commodity guys that the effects are stronger. And we also control commodity index commodity prices directly and you know everything stays but that's because our sample is the emerging markets dominated by the diamond commodity guys so that is definitely an alternative explanation but only specific to those guys so all the results goes for the non-commodity guys without without those guys now and the reason is exactly going back to this uh it is not they hike uh, earlier that made the appreciation remember the figure i showed on mexico mexico is one of those countries appreciated with a dollar because interest rate differential you know, increase earlier, so that's definitely true. But if you look at, you know, many countries, they didn't increase uh, before US. There are very famous one, Brazil, very, very famous, Peru, Mexico, true. But there are also countries that didn't do this or countries never increased, right? Turkey, right? So, okay, it is hard to pin this down, of course, because say, well, okay, if there are like five of your countries increased before the US, that's it, you know, that might, you know, drive the results. So one of the robustness check is similar to the commodity thing we did, we say, okay, can we separate these countries from the others? But um, most importantly, when we do this also in the historical episode where we have you know, more data, we see that it is really not that much about the you raise earlier or you also raise, basically mimic, but it is how you do it. If you look at Brazil in 2013 and Brazil now, okay, so it's just like huge difference. Brazil and Indonesia in the 2013 taper tantrum, when they were raising the interest rate, they went on the record and say, we are doing this to prevent exchange rate depreciation and to stem capital outflows. This is in Article 4, you know, you can go and look at it. Look at this time around. This time around, you look at these guys' statement, there isn't a single word about the exchange rate depreciation and capital outflows. All they talk about is inflation expectation being, risking to be the anchored. I mean, Brazilians have a daily inflation expectation index. They say, we look at that and we don't like it. There's an overheating in the economy. Everybody experienced that. This is like recovery from COVID and you know, our mandate requires to do this. And this is exactly what this IMF index, you know, done by Phillips and Coulter is capturing. You know, they, they look at things like, you know, is there a statement accompanying the policy decision and what is in that statement? That's monetary policy credibility. If you are a floating exchange regime country, and if you say, you know, I'm going to use the policy rate only for price stability, then you don't use the policy rate to, you know, prevent exchange rate and capital outflows. You can do other things. You can be a managed floating country and you can do macro prudential for that. But that again goes back to this, how you explain these things. And that's what we are measuring. And that's why the UIP premium is, is, is critical because exchange rate appreciation and UIP premium increasing is something observed actually historically. Even, you know, you, you hike more than the US and your exchange rate appreciates vis-a-vis the dollar, your UIP still goes up. 
Okay, and that's exactly what didn't happen this time. Thank you very much. So uh, let me thank again our two wonderful <laughs> keynote speakers. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.